Hi. Have you found yourself worrying about the state of the world recently? Wondering if we can actually withstand the tension that's growing between groups of people based on things like nationality, religion and politics? As a neuroscientist, I find myself wondering if we're on the brink of a global emotional crisis because we certainly seem to be experiencing a lot more fear, anger, disgust, shame and sadness than joy, excitement or love, trust in the world recently. What's been interesting to me is that we're all talking about this at home, with friends and colleagues, and even debating quite passionately with people we don't know that well. So what can we all do to transform fear into trust? I want to answer, using the science of the brain, the question that's on everyone's lips at the moment. Can we get through this peacefully? So let's start by establishing what this situation even is. I want to be very clear, it's not about your or my opinion, or being right or wrong, or even our political choices. It's about the evolution of the human brain from tribal origins, through ethnic and geographic diversification, to the creation of the nation state all the way up to modern nationalism. It's about the history of why we created in and out groups in our societies whether we're hardwired to act on stereotypes or whether we can change, how we regulate our fears and other emotions, and perhaps most importantly, how we might reach our fullest human potential by knowing how our brains work. Part of understanding where we've come to involves looking at where we've come from. It's been interesting, you could say, being British or American recently, I'm British, I'm employed by an iconic American institution, the MIT, and we have felt like our choices have been scrutinised by the world and our decisions judged, and we've come out seriously wanting for looking like we have caused the worst thing you can do to a human, being cast out. Because when we lived in caves, being cast out of the cave meant certain death from the elements, from predators, from enemies, from lack of food and lack of warmth, both literally from shelter, but also from the warmth of interaction, affection and love. We became the most successful animal on the planet because we could exist in these large groups, 150 or more. And the quickest way to recognise who was in your group, who was friend or foe, was what you looked like. So skin colour, hair colour, eye shape, hair texture, and then later language. Now, we live in mixed race families, many of us speak two or more languages, but some of our old wiring is holding us back. Notice I didn't say hard wiring, because that implies that it's fixed and can't be changed. I don't mind the term soft wiring, because stereotypes do exist, but we can override our unconscious biases, and we can transform fear into trust. The history of our species has created an inherently us-versus-them construct due to these three main safety gearings of the brain, our survival emotions, loss aversion and unconscious bias. We have some pretty awful examples of us-versus-them in our history. Slavery, the Holocaust, apartheid, to name a few. Sometimes, particularly with my work in South Africa, there are moments of true joy and love in terms of moving forward. But at other times, you still palpably feel the opposite. But as Mandela said, no one is born hating somebody because of the colour of their skin. You have to learn to do that. And if you can learn that, then in the brain, you can unlearn or override that pathway. So let's look at the brain and the science behind human emotions like love and hate. Deep in our limbic systems, which is the ancient emotional and intuitive part of the brain, we have two almond-shaped structures, each called an amygdala. And this is where our emotions like fear originate. Due to the wiring of the brain, the survival emotions, fear, anger, disgust, shame and sadness, have a much stronger effect on the brain than the attachment emotions, joy, excitement, or love, trust. 
The survival emotions correlate to levels of the stress hormone cortisol. And we will do anything not to feel the effects of high cortisol, like being afraid or ashamed. And that's why, historically, it's been easy to motivate people based on fear-inducing scenarios or disgust at someone else's behaviour. The US presidential elections were actually a prime example of this, with candidates taking out TV adverts, highlighting scandals and allegations about the other person, instead of focusing on what they themselves had to offer. Stress and cortisol bias our decision-making systems to avoid risk, avoid change, and anything we feel we can't control. In this state, the blood supply moves away from the higher centres of the brain down to what's called survival mode. And here we can carry out our basic daily needs, and enough to keep our jobs and family intact, but then we don't have enough resources for the executive functions of the brain, those that regulate our emotions, override our biases, help us to think flexibly and creatively, and to solve complex problems. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the attachment emotions, love, trust, and joy, excitement. And these correlate to the bonding hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is released during childbirth, breastfeeding, and it underlies the bond between newborn babies and their parents. It's also part of the chemical cocktail of falling in love and social bonding, like friendship. There's evidence that when the fabric of society falls apart to the point of rioting or rebelling against authority, this is related to lower societal oxytocin levels. And higher oxytocin levels can even make men more faithful, and I've got a few scientific references there to prove that. <laughs> so in this state, blood flows freely to the higher centres of the brain, we lower our guard, we feel warm towards others, we're more likely to take risks in a good way and to collaborate because we have the resources to trust rather than default to the state of mistrust. Referendums and elections touch upon human emotions to gather votes because we have such a strong need for that sense of belonging, which is essentially love and trust. You'll notice that I mentioned mistrust as a default state for the brain. This is because the strongest gearing of our, of our brain is something known as loss aversion. This is our uh, preference to avoid loss over trying to gain any reward. To our brains, it's better not to lose five pounds than it is to find five pounds. Studies suggest that psychologically, losses are twice as powerful as, as gains. And although traditional economists consider loss aversion and all its related effects to be totally irrational, this is exactly why they play such an important part in things like elections and recognising in and out groups. In and out groups were very useful concepts in primitive times when mistakenly engaging with a member of another tribe could have proved fatal. That's less the case today, but in the intervening millennia, that idea has become ingrained into our brains. And with over 150 biases identified, this goes way beyond race and gender to include things like social class, wealth, education, religion, politics, national and regional roots, and even physical attractiveness. So the basis of our unconscious biases is that even if you don't think you have a racist, ageist, or sexist bone in your body, if that stereotype exists in the world, then it's to some extent wired into our brains. And this was meant to keep us safe, because our brain's priority is to ensure our survival until we can reproduce. And we collaborated in these large groups, essentially to compete with other groups. So once our survival was ensured, our thoughts and activities naturally turned to disadvantaging these other groups. And in fact, when you even think about groups of people that you don't like, the disgust pathways of your limbic system light up you're more likely to feel like that and be biased when you are tired, hungry, or feeling threatened. Tired and hungry indicate low resources to your brain, and feeling threatened drains any resources that you might have circulating in the blood flow, making it harder for you to override your unconscious biases. There are fascinating examples of judges granting more parole after recent meal and break times the little circles are when the judges had had something to eat. 
and making more unfavourable decisions based on racial bias the further away they had got from fueling their brains. And it doesn't end there with how we think about other people. There are also biases that we perpetuate about ourselves. So I'm a woman of Indian origin. If I was going for a job interview at, let's say, an accountancy firm, and it was for a job where I had to be particularly numerate, and just before that interview, someone said to me, I really like your dress, where did you get it from? That would inadvertently remind me that I'm female, and I would then be likely to underperform in that job interview because the stereotype in the world is that women aren't as good with numbers as men. If, however, just before the same interview, someone asked me where in India my parents were from, I would then be likely to overperform in that interview because the stereotype in the world is that pe Asian people are good with numbers. So who has felt inferior, uh, inferior or cast out or treated unfairly recently? Europeans, the British, Mexicans, Democrats, Muslims, the list could go on and on. The increase in the rise of nationalism in Europe and other parts of the world has crept up on us. Wave after wave of nationalism in response to the influx of immigration due to economic stresses and geopolitical crises elsewhere in the world. The negative brain response is more marked initially if you look obviously different, so skin colour or recognisable feature. It's more insidious and psychological if it takes more than a first glance to realise that this person's different to you. Usually, there's integration within one or two generations, and this isn't just subjective, this is based on um, brain testing of people's responses to groups of other ethnicities. And this happens more quickly if people become proficient at the language of the country that they've moved to, and it can take longer if people live in ghettos and don't embrace some cultural norms. At the end of the day, we all experience the full range of basic human emotions. And almost all of us are in an outgroup somehow. I could say, I only want to be friends with people in my age range. Or I could say, age doesn't matter to me, but I think I've got more in common with multilingual, university-educated people that love to travel. Or I could choose to have no barriers to friendship. None of us should believe that we can't change at any age, given what we know now about neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain to change itself well into adulthood. Humans have evolved the potential to reason, to override our emotions. We don't have to live by these fear-driven and emotion-based decisions that we've made. We can think outside of the box, we can hold opposing views, and we can imagine a different future or reality. So let's take a neuroscience-based look at what we could actually do to move forward as a human race. We could start a new narrative, which, if properly taken up and spread, could help us to finally realise that any hatred or violence based on things like national or religious loyalties could be seriously endangering our sustainability as a species. Language is really powerful, and if we start to tell a different story based on articulating our attachment to motion, so looking for what unites us rather than what separates us, then we can actually change the way that our brains operate. We can override our survival emotions, our loss aversion, and our unconscious biases. There are a wide number of factors that, at policy and international level, could contribute to this. But I want to talk to you about the practical things that could make the biggest difference day to day. Make sure that your brain is rested, fueled, and oxygenated, particularly around times where you might be making an important decision. On a day after you haven't had a good night's sleep, you're operating with an apparent IQ loss of five to eight points. This could be crucial in you deciding who's in your in-group and who's not. Don't skip meals. Remember the judges granting parole. And if you think there's any chance that you might judge someone harshly based on a bias that you have, then go for a walk or at least take 10 deep breaths to oxygenate your brain before you meet them. Try to raise your awareness of the boundaries for your in-group and broaden it. Learn a new language, travel to a place you've never been before, hang out with people with totally different life experiences, or just smile at a stranger. In the book, Train Your Mind, Change Your Brain, 
there's evidence that just making a list of people you know you could turn to if you really needed help can actually reduce your bias against outgroups. But most of all, choose love and trust over fear and hate whenever you can, and role model this to help other people to do the same. Remember, we're much more similar than we are different. If I couldn't see your bodies now sitting on all these chairs and I could only see your brains, then as a neuroscientist and a medical doctor, I could probably take quite a good guess at whether you were male or female. If I could dissect your brain or look at it on, in a scanner, then I'd be able to tell if you had a disease like Alzheimer's or you'd had a stroke and many, many more things. But nothing would tell me the colour of your skin or what religion you are. So what one thing are you prepared to do to change your brain and influence the brains around you? I believe that if we each did one thing based on understanding how our brains work, we would not only touch the people that we know, but eventually we could transform the world. <laughs>